The lesson from, this, from the Old Testament for this morning is found in Exodus 33, 12 through 23 on page 62 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that, I, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, and I in your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, and I, your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do, not, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and you will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me alive. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Mark chapter 6, 45 through 56, on page 32 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After saying farewell to them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gesenret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And whenever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The word of God for the people of God. Pray with me. Lord, sometimes we need you to reveal yourself. We doubt the direction that you've called us. We doubt your existence. We doubt your presence and your favor with us. And so like Moses, we need you to pass by us and show us your glory. Forgive our weak faith, Father, and strengthen us by your word. Strengthen my word during this time, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, it's the question that every man dreads. Do you notice anything different? Oh. 
I'll give you a hint, I just went to the hairdresser. Oh no, it's even worse. It's a question that every man dreads and I have learned that at least in our family it takes nine years to the, get to the point where it's understood that I just don't know. Nine years. There's a difference there that I'm trying to see, but I just can't see it. Well, I had a quarter of an inch taken off. A quarter of an inch. <laughs> I, I, <sighs> Take four and I'll notice, really. Seeing things and, and trying to perceive the difference can be very, very difficult. I'm convinced that it's not just men, though, as well. Uh, although we, we tend to suffer from, from this problem in particular. I told a story several weeks ago about uh, Jim Singleton, who, who will go to dinner with his wife to, to other people's houses, and they'll walk out. And Sarah will say to Jim, weren't those lovely curtains on the wall? And Jim says, there were curtains in that room? We see, but we don't see. We don't perceive what's going on or what's in a room or, or, or what's happening in a certain circumstance. We can become very, very tunnel visioned, so focused on different things and, and, and so naturally drawn to other aspects of a situation that we can totally miss something that's so obvious to others. This is a little bit like I hinted at in the, in the children's sermon of what's going on with the disciples. They are right there with Jesus. They have been with him for five chapters now in Mark, and at times they just don't get it. They see him, but they don't see him. And that's kind of at the heart of the story for today. As we come off the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, of the, of the multiplication of the loaves and of the fishes into this, uh, walking on water, per, by any accounts, one of the more recognizable miracles that Jesus does. As I said, last week we, we talked about the, the story immediately preceding, the feeding of the 5,000. And what happened in that is that Jesus asked the disciples to feed this crowd late in the day and they were just eminently practical people and said, are we supposed to spend two-thirds of a year's worth of wages and feed these people? Are you kidding me, Jesus? And Jesus responds to them in a manner that says, you still don't get it. What do we have? And what can we do? And he multiplies the loaves and fishes and there are basketfuls of food left over and everyone eats. And it's remarkable. But because of the disciples' practicality, they lacked some spiritual insight. They lacked the ability to see what was going on. And so we come to today's story and we found out, find out that Jesus immediately sends his disciples away. Mark is very, very good for using this word immediately. Things kind of happen pretty quickly in Mark. If you suffer from ADD, this is the gospel for you. Don't read Luke. Don't even try it. Mark is your, is your person. He says immediately a lot, and as soon as the, the, the feeding and the, the food is collected at the end, Mark sends his disciples away, and it seems a little bit hasty, and we're not sure why, except that Mark tells us it's because Jesus was going to dismiss the crowd. He was going to say, literally say farewell and send them on their way. And so Jesus sends his disciples away for whatever reason, possibly with a plan, because we find out that they know where they're headed. So perhaps they had talked about things ahead of time, and Jesus just wanted him to get going. He wanted them to get going. Occasionally, when we're in a hurry, and perhaps you have done this if you are a parent, you know that you are just about ready, and if you don't call down and say, hey, coat's on, it's going to take more time. 
And so while buttoning your shirt from your bedroom, you scream down and say, coat's on, shoes on, get in the car. So that by the time you hit the ignition, everyone's ready. Perhaps that's a bit of what's going on here. But then Jesus goes and he doesn't join his disciples. Back in chapter 1 of Mark, Jesus in his first healing ministry seems to get a bit overwhelmed. He seems to get a bit sidetracked. And so he goes out into a deserted place and prays. And he regains his focus. And here, once again, after a healing ministry, after everything that is going on, Jesus sends his disciples away. He sends the crowd away. And he goes up a mountain to pray alone. It's interesting, this is the first time that Mark introduces that he goes up a mountain. And like last week, where Jesus' actions looked a bit like Moses, feeding the people in the wilderness. Here he sounds like Moses a bit again, going up the mountain to meet with God. And so the disciples are on the water, and Jesus is on the the mountain. It's one of the few times in the Gospels that we actually find Jesus alone. For a brief moment, there's quiet in the Gospel. However, that can't last for too much longer. And sometime in the, in the late evening, Jesus notices that the disciples are having some troubles. Disciples, of course, are, are traveling across the Sea of Galilee. We've been around the Sea of Galilee this entire time. And they're going across the Sea of Galilee, and they're hitting some strong wind. This is not uh, a supernatural thing here. This is actually quite a common occurrence on the Sea of Galilee. Winds, uh, winds and storms will blow up like that. If you've ever lived on a, on a lake, you can kind of appreciate this phenomenon. Katie and I, when we were first married, we lived, we get to joke, we lived at a, in a cottage on the lake with 98 acres. I was a camp director, so we also had about 600 kids. Uh, but uh, we lived on Lake Erie. And one of the things that you have to pay attention to as a camp director on Lake Erie, because there are a number of our camps right along the shore there, is you have to watch the skies, the weather reports, and then the sky. Because when you see the dark clouds on the horizon, you can count with some fair amount of accuracy about 15 minutes before that storm's on you. The, the lake just kind of tends to, to accelerate the speed of weather. Whether it's a storm in summer or the phenomena known as lake effect snow in the winter. It does some funny things. And here they hit a windstorm. And the disciples are are struggling. and Literally, it says that the disciples are being harassed by the winds. And Jesus is moved, seemingly again, by compassion. The same feeling that, that moved him to feed the crowds moves him here to move towards the disciples. And so Jesus starts walking out on the sea towards the disciples. Mark notes that this is during the fourth watch of the night. And in case you, you know, don't understand ancient Roman timekeeping, that's between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. And so the disciples are rowing late, late at night. And here comes Jesus, moseying along the lake, moseying on the lake. And it says that he wanted to pass by them. It's kind of a strange phrase. We would expect that Jesus would want to meet up with them. Just kind of go there and be with them. Perhaps take an oar and help out. But he wants to pass by them. Why? What's, what's at this, the heart of this strange phrase? Uh, we don't think of passing by someone as a compassionate action. Uh, if I get a call from the hospital, I don't think that anyone 
expects my compassion to be so moved that I go up to the hall, I find their room, and I pass by. I don't think that would be in the books for good pastoral care. Similarly, I, I don't think that, that when we're looking to call in someone, we just sort of drive past their house. We have laws against that sort of thing, in fact. That isn't good pastoral care. It's a bit creepy. And Jesus is going to pass by. But we need to look at our Exodus text for a moment for some inspiration. Because in Exodus, we find out that Moses is looking for some encouragement. Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, if we have found favor, if you're really with us, give us some sort of sign. Give me something, God, to run on. It's kind of a familiar plea when we're in a tight spot, when we think we're doing what we're supposed to, and we're not quite sure. We, we want to say, Lord, something. Give me anything. And God responds to Moses, you have found favor, and I do know you by name. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass by you. You can't see my face because you wouldn't survive. But you can see my glory. God places Moses in the, in the cleft in, in, a, in an outcove of the rock and passes by, holds his hand over Moses until he passes by. And Moses sees God passed by in all of his glory. I, I think it, it, there's a, a bit of mundaneness to that that sometimes we don't appreciate, that sometimes we think, pass by me. But to see the glory of the Lord in its full splendor, that would be an encouraging, encouraging moment. And so it seems that Jesus here is not just looking to pass by in a I'll see you on the other side sort of way. But he's looking to encourage. He's looking to strengthen. He's looking for once to reveal who he is and strengthen them, strengthen the disciples by his glory and by his power. It was an act of encouragement or strengthening. However, it backfires because the disciples again are, are practical and it's late in the night and they've been rowing and they're going up against the winds. And Jesus comes walking and they look and this is not something you want to see. If you think about it, if you're rowing against the wind and it's late and you're tired, the last thing you want to see is someone walking on the water towards you. Not exactly the most encouraging thought. And they think in this moment, this is a ghost, it's a demon, it's an apparition, it is something they don't know that it's Jesus. And like anyone scared out of their minds, they start screaming. To which Jesus responds, it's me. Take heart. It's me. I'm here. Yet the disciples still struggle in these moments and fail to understand what Jesus, who Jesus is and what's happening. The scripture tells us flat out that they didn't understand what was going on. In fact, they were astonished. Literally, they were exceedingly astonished because of what happened and because they didn't understand about the miracle of the bread. Their hearts were hardened. Back in chapter 4, Jesus calmed the winds and the waves and at that moment they were amazed. They asked themselves, who is this? That was the text that kicked off probably a good six weeks of me asking the question, who is this? And they see it once again and they're utterly astound, astounded because they haven't understood. They haven't seen Jesus and really 
seen Jesus for who he is. They're left dumbfounded in the boat. They get to the other side. And Jesus' popularity once again gets the better of him. The, the people start coming from all over. They find out in Gennesaret that he's there. And they start coming from towns and villages and farms and bringing the sick into the marketplace, the most crowded areas for him to heal. Because they know what he can do and they desperately want him to do it. There's a certain amount of faith that they have, even if it's misguided, even if they don't quite see who Jesus is. But they come and they bring their sick, trusting that he's able to do something. It's a remarkable thing that even this sort of faith, Jesus is willing to work with. He's will willing to take and to use. And so we can see a, a couple of ways that this might apply to our lives. First of all, we see that Jesus, excuse me, first of all, we see that, that the disciples have problem, a problem seeing Jesus with the eyes of faith. Jesus has has gone through, he's done amazing things, and the disciples still can't see it. And we might wonder, after all, how can they be so dense for so long? Eventually, don't you get it? Don't you go back on chapter 4 and reread it and say, oh yeah, I see it now. But the reality is that we can tend to do the same things. We can, we can see things. We can see Jesus and miss who he is and what he's doing in our lives. Because we become so focused on our own expectations. We become so guided by our own expectations. And by our own practicality at times, like last week. Seeing by faith is an exercise. It's, it's something that you have to do over and over we can suffer from spiritual blindness. We can suffer even from regular blindness when we're not looking for something. There's a, a, a little while ago there was a um, video that came out from some researchers who were trying to show that we can blind ourselves to what's going on. Perhaps you've seen it. Uh, I have that with me here because it makes a good point even if you've seen it before. I'm going to ask Connor to cue this up and to follow the instructions on the screen. Count how many times you see the team wearing white passing the ball. There is a correct answer here. The answer is 16. How many of you saw the gorilla, though? You might have seen this before, and it, like it says, about half the people who see this video miss that there's a gorilla going across the screen. But if you've seen this before, did you notice the fact that the curtain color changed? Or that one member of the team wearing black just left? Take a look. Gorilla walks on, the color, curtain color changes, and a member of the team wearing black leaves. When you're looking for a gorilla, you can miss some other things. We can be blinded even when something is perfectly well in front of us. I really like this because I've seen it before. They, they, they showed this on the Today Show about a year ago. And so I thought going into this one, I thought, I'm, this is a great one. I feel good about myself. I know that the gorilla is there. And then they had the curtain color change. And, uh, 
And then a member of the team left, and I didn't see it. Are we seeing Jesus for who he is? Do we notice him when he does things that we don't quite expect or anticipate? It's interesting because a member of the the one team leaving also begs the question for us, do we notice when a member of the team leaves? That can be hard to do, especially right now in the life of Good Shepherd. It's no secret that our worship attendance is up. And in the midst of increase, it can be hard to see when a member of the team leaves. Are we paying attention? Are we seeing with the eyes of faith? Are we asking God to open our eyes? (laughs) The other aspect of this that is encouraging is quite honestly the opposite side of the coin. Sometimes we feel that we, we have trouble approaching Jesus because I haven't been to church in a while or I, I, I haven't been as good in my prayer life. I haven't been as faithful about this. I haven't been as faithful about this. That I have this sin dogging me. I have that sin dogging me. I have a relationship that's just really bugging the dickens out of me and I don't think God likes the way I'm thinking about it. Nowhere in this text did it ever say that the people in Gennesaret knew exactly who Jesus was. Nowhere in in the text does it say that they gave a full Trinitarian response to to Jesus. Nowhere in the text does it say that they, they were able to reveal all the mysteries of God about Jesus. What we do know is that they had faith in him. They knew he could heal and they sought him out. And so when we feel like our faith is inadequate, when our faith is misguided, when we don't have this doctrine right or we don't do this practice very well or Lord, if anyone knew what I was thinking, Jesus can use that faith as well. He doesn't give them a theological exam. He heals. He takes the faith that they give and works Miracles. There's a Savior who is looking to bring the kingdom, who's looking to restore people. And so, despite the disciples' presence with Jesus during the miracle of the loaves and fishes, they don't recognize his true identity. But he's willing to work with faith. Even faith misguided and faith minuscule. Are we willing to let Jesus use our faith? And are we willing to let God open our eyes to see with spiritual eyes what he's up to? Let's pray. Lord God, the image of us as your sheep is all too apt. For Lord, we can be slow to understand who you are. Slow to see your glory and slow to put our faith in you. Seal this word into our lives so that we can trust you more fully, so that we can approach you more readily. And we can love you more deeply. Holy Spirit, help us to live out these words in our lives. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.